So it's, it's definitely a pleasure for all of us here to be in the Ramanujam Hall today. And if I may use a quote, Shashwatam Jeevnam Amram Prem, eternal life, undying passion. That has been the reflection of the work of great mathematicians like Professor Ramanujan and others across the world. Today we all come together, I would say we all come together from the fraternity in oneness for the cause of mathematics. For an open cause of mathematics to bring back the delight in mathematics as it has always been in India. So welcome to the Cambridge India Math Symposium. The idea and the objective for today is to bring together key members from the maths community, educators, academic mathematicians, users of maths from education and policy, and together we intend to have this discussion and look for common grounds and beliefs that we could later work on. I do take the pleasure to thank one, all of you for making the time, especially our panelists who have made all the effort to come here, contribute to this symposium, and I'm sure that we'll be able to have some great discussions today. If I may, I would love to invite our first panel, which will talk about the purpose of school mathematics. I invite our chair for that, Professor Subramaniam, who is the director, Homi Baba Center for Science Education, Mumbai. He has been involved actively in mathematics, education at school level in terms of development of curricular and co-curricular teaching materials, teacher training, teachers and teaching students. He has done research pertaining to the cognitive aspects of mathematics, learning mental experimentations in reasoning and problem solving. Professor, please may I request you and going forward, you would uh, introduce all the panelists. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for Cambridge Mathematics and others who organized the event. Uh, we have a very engaging and interesting session ahead of us. Uh, a panel discussion on purposes of school mathematics. And I'm sure, uh, looking at the lineup, that we're going to have a fairly stimulating discussion. And we look forward also to participation from the audience. I'll lay out the structure of the session soon. Uh, <clears throat> but first, let me tell you about uh, briefly about the speakers uh, on the panel. And uh, before I say, do that, I'd like to invite them on to stage. Uh, Professor Ramanujam, uh, Professor Lynn McClure, and Mr. Uday Chandran, has he arrived? I think he's due to arrive shortly. And we have another panelist who will join us online on video, uh, Dr. Shailesh Shirali. <clears throat> All of them are very experienced in mathematics education, and some of them also in other fields as well. And what I will do is to introduce the speaker just before they begin to speak. So I'll take a, a half a minute or so to introduce the speakers. Uh, so we will uh, begin shortly. So the panelists will speak each for about 12 minutes at the most. If you think you can uh, cut it shorter, that's fine. But 12 minutes is the time uh, deadline. And uh, so that we leave enough time for the audience uh, to respond, to ask questions, and so on. So at the end of uh, the, when we have uh, four panelists, and when all the four have spoken, we'll take a little bit of time off uh, for some discussion amongst yourselves. And then you can ask questions to the panelists, and each of the panelists will have some time to respond to the questions. OK, so the session is about purpose of school mathematics. And I'm sure that uh, we will go well beyond the sorts of normal things that are said about purposes of school mathematics. I'm sure critical perspectives will be brought in, whether they are real purposes, uh, whether they are artifactual, something that we have set up uh, in society, something that really helps learners. And I think these critical perspectives are going to be very important and how they have a bearing on the existing 
on the present curriculum. Okay, so without further ado, we will start, and I suggest that we start uh, a little bit differently in the sequence. So, uh, uh, Shailesh, uh, can you hear me? Hello? Dr. Shailesh Shirali? I can just about hear you. Okay. Your voice is breaking a little bit. Okay. So what I'm hoping that when I... All right. Before I go. Okay. So I suggest that we move the camera and uh, the microphone here to the podium because then it would be uh, convenient for the speakers and for Dr. Shirali to participate as well. No, I think... Uh, We'll begin with uh, Dr. Shailesh Shirali. Uh, Dr. Shirali has a PhD in operations research from the University of Texas. He has taught mathematics at Rishi Valley School for more than two decades. He served as principal of the school and received the national award for teachers in 2003 from the President of India. He's been closely associated, closely involved with the Mathematical Olympiad movement in India. He's actively involved in writing and publication activity. He serves on the Council of Editors for Resonance, an expository uh, journal for science and maths education published by Indian Academy of Science. He is the founding editor of Samasya, a problem-solving journal for school and college students. And something that's missing here, uh, which is very important, is that he's founded a wonderful, beautiful journal called At Right Angles, which is for school mathematics. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's published jointly by Rishi Valley and the Azim Premji uh, University. It's available freely online, and Shailesh is the main uh, editor and the founder of this uh, journal. So uh, over to you, Shailesh, and you have uh, 12 minutes. At the end of 10 minutes, you'll hear my voice interrupting you and uh, telling you that it's Hello? two minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Ravi? Can you hear Ravi, me? Ravi, do I start? Uh, let me move to the other uh, mic, just a minute. Automata theory, mathematical logic, modal and epistemic logics, and so on, and game theory, security theory, maths and science education, as well as science popularization. But I must mention that he's been very active in mathematics education. He chaired the uh, position, the focus group on math education for National Curriculum Framework 2005. And he's been extremely active at all levels, including adult literacy, uh, te teaching children mathematics and so on. So over to you. Yeah. Talk is on the, the session is on the purpose of mathematics education. And uh, what are the goals of mathematics education? The position paper that uh, Ravi alluded to says uh, the goal of, what is the goal of mathematics education? It is the mathematization of the child's thought process. What is that? Well, George Polia talks about uh, the narrow aims and higher aims of teaching mathematics. For him, the narrow aim is to turn out employable adults who eventually contribute to social and economic development, which calls for developing certain skills, certain skills that broadly relate to numeracy, certain so-called life skills that mathematics gives, which is a... Uh, good understanding of arithmetic, geometry, data handling, some algebra, and which broadly uh, resonates with the kind of content of school mathematics as it has been for quite a long time. Then he also talks about the higher aim of uh, mathematics education, which is developing the inner resources of the growing child. And Polia goes on to say that if mathematics is, if there was a school for thinking, mathematics would find a place in it. So if there is something that mathematics teaches at all, it's about clear thinking. Wheeler says it's more useful to know how to mathematize than to know a lot of mathematics. So what is mathematization about? Now, if you look at what mathematicians do, what does doing mathematics consist of? What is the kind of activity that you see if you see people doing mathematics? Now you'll find many things happening there. Now, I have a list of things, and each of these probably deserves examples. We don't have time, but you can think of the kind of examples that I have in mind. When estimating quantities, 
Now, you're not talking about, I'm not talking about calculating quantities, but I'm talking about estimating quantities. And this is something that you see all the time in the practice of mathematics. Approximating terms. Now, this very vocabulary of talking about approximating terms, which is very important in doing mathematics. And then, local definitions. Not only some God-given frozen definitions, but also, let us call a function definite if, dot, dot, dot. It doesn't mean that you're meaning something for uh, all the world to celebrate, right? It's something local, maybe you need, need it for four pages, use it, throw it away. Now, this is something very common. Employing heuristics. Now, heuristics are those which are not like formulas. They work sometimes. They work a lot of the time, but they don't always work. But you try to use heuristics in things that you do. And then coming up with conjectures, which of course is very important. Working out many interesting cases. Now, what are interesting cases? Which cases are interesting? Is there any way to define which are cases are interesting and which are uninteresting cases? Well, but uh, it's very important to develop a field. Now, subject knowledge is, of course, important for all this. But the processes involved have little to do with specific content knowledge. It's really not about algebra or geometry that we are talking about, but a way of doing things. I want to continue with this list. Doing mathematics also means selecting between representations, devising new ones. Now, a rational number is a point on the line. It's also written as in the form p by q with p in common, p and q have no common divisor, they're integer. Different representations, and you use different representations and thinking of which representation you want at a particular point of time. Or maybe devising a representation as you need. Looking for invariances. This is something that's very important. Many things, you look at how things change and look at what remains common. In paper folding, you do a lot of paper folding. And uh, you observe that many things you can do, but the area is something that remains constant. In fact, you can think of an area as a kind of invariant of many things that you do. Looking actively for counterexamples. This is something that we almost never talk about. Not about looking for proof, but actually look for counterexamples. And not look for counterexamples, look actively for counterexamples. Coming up with a proof strategy. Not a proof, but a proof strategy. Strategy to tackle the problem. Constructive. Constructing an intuitive argument, often with pictures. Simplify. Now, this is, I think, probably unique to mathematics. You have a problem to solve in the specific, you generalize. You simplify by generalization and to make them easier to address. And then, very important, building on answers to generate new questions for exploration. Interesting problems are those when you solve, lead to new problems. The more problems it leads to, the more interesting the problem is. Now, these are experiences. These are activities, experiences, what I would call mathematical experience or experiences of, which go along with mathematization, which are mostly missing in school. Now, the content areas of mathematics are very clear. Arithmetic, mensuration, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, data handling, whatever is the favorite list that we can think of. And uh, the processes that I'm talking about is use of patterns, visualization, use of heuristics, estimation, approximation, making connections, making connections between different parts of things that you learn, formal communication, which is a very important process in learning mathematics. So the, the shift from content to process is what I'm talking about in terms of something that we want clarity on when we think of the purpose of mathematics education in school. So typical classrooms I would call preset drills conducted on the blow of a whistle like those, you know, up, down, and so on. Everyone going through the motions. Now, exploration and multiplicity of approaches are essential for encouraging the kind of processes listed above. Now, which means that curriculum needs to be reshaped so that processes of the kind that I have talked about can be actually emphasized in the classroom. And then the big question is assessment. Now, we have very little understanding of process assessment in general. And that's a big problem if you want to talk about mathematization. So we're not talking about shift in content, but in process. This can also be a way of ensuring that every child's attention is engaged and remove the sense of fear and failure that haunts mathematics classrooms in general. So this means that somehow we have to de-emphasize the tall and sequential nature, the spindly nature of 
mathematics at school, where you have a problem with uh, fractions, you're going to have a problem with decimals, and then you're going to have a, very likely then you will have a problem with algebra, and if you have a problem with algebra, you're going to have a problem with trigonometry, and then you're dead with calculus, and so on. So, so this means allowing a multiplicity of approaches, what I would call breaking the tyranny of the one right answer obtained by the one algorithm that has been taught in class. There are lots of problems that need to be overcome, if you want to think about this. Well, the biggest problem in India is that board examinations and competitive examinations cast very long shadows, right? I mean, their shadow is, you know, eclipses even class 7 September exam, right? Not, I'm not talking about board exams that come much later. So, in fact, every examination ever conducted in classrooms resembles a board examination, which is a mass examination which can only have happen in a particular style. There are several communities involved, mathematicians, teachers, education researchers, activists, NGOs, corporate entities, but there is a severe problem of compartmentalization. You know, there's almost very little communication between these communities. And schools have to prepare students for future study and for employment, and hence a focus on recall, fluency, accuracy, and certain ways of working, certain kinds of problem solving. Now, so schools operate in that milieu, and that milieu very rarely addresses the kind of mathematization. And then a big problem is teachers. Now, Felix Klein has a very beautiful uh, thing where he calls it uh, a double discontinuity. He says, look, teachers go through all this torture in school when they learn mathematics as mathematics teachers. Understanding is a big problem. And then you somehow come out, make it to university, not necessarily because mathematics is your passion, you understood something, and of course in university, you experience a very completely different kind of mathematics. You barely learn, make it through that, and then you come to education, education curriculum, which has very little to do with whatever you, mathematics you learned at the university, and then you have back to school mathematics, which is, resembles nothing of what you learned, either in university or in pedagogy. So this is what he calls a double discontinuity, and this is a very serious problem that teacher education doesn't seem to address very well. So, what is the vision that we are talking about to come back? It's school mathematics takes place in a situation where children learn to enjoy mathematics. And I use the term advisedly, that they learn to enjoy mathematics. Because, you know, saying that, oh, mathematics is great fun, great fun, great fun, repeatedly only puts off people who find it very difficult, right? But there is something that it, it, it can be actually learned, and it's wonderful even then. They learn important mathematics. Fair amount of mathematics that comes in school books turns out to be trivial. I mean, I never forget the UP State Board. Yeah, UP State Board, uh, Lucknow. I saw one uh, thing from uh, primary class where there was a thing that, uh, you know, in a garden there were so many goats and so many cows grazing. How many legs were there? Now, unless you are a butcher, why would you interest, be interested in counting legs of goats and cows together? Right? No, that's trivial mathematics, right? So you want children to see mathematics as part of their life experience. They pose and solve meaningful problems. Not only solve, but pose problems which are meaningful to them. Not about, this is not about real life, right? This is about life lived by children. That could be a fantasy world, but it's something meaningful to children. They use abstractions to perceive relationships, to see structure, to reason about things, to argue the truth or falsity of statements. And teachers expect to engage every child in class. And the teacher expectations are very important. When I walk into a class and do not expect that I'm going to engage everyone, of course it's doomed to fail. So I'll end with a quote. So Thurston, most of my quotes are usually from Thurston. So this is a beautiful statement. He says, as mathematics teachers, we need to pay much more attention to communicating not just our definitions, theorems, and proofs, but also our ways of thinking. He says, however flawed you are, but as a teacher, your way of thinking is very important to expose to children. So we need to appreciate the value of different ways of thinking about the same mathematical structure. So I think mathematization is about all this, which is somehow the purpose of school education. However nebulous it may be, it is worth engaging with and uh, translate some meaningful purpose into our school education. Thank you very much, uh, Jam. It was uh, 
stimulating, I think, and thank you also for sticking to the time. So, uh, is Varuni here? No. Okay. So, shall we go ahead with you, Professor Lin? Uh, I invite her to uh, give her thoughts. Just a brief uh, note about Professor Lynn McClure. She's presently the director of Cambridge Mathematics, which is the organizer of the symposium. She is the former director of the prestigious Enrich Project. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this. It's a very interesting problem solving and mathematical learning. Based in the University of Cambridge's Center for Mathematical Sciences, Enrich is a well-established math education project which works across the maths and education faculties. Its aim is to enhance the mathematical experiences of all students through offering rich activities which promote mathematical thinking. She's had a very varied career in maths education with experience which ranges from headship of a small primary school to a principal lecturer and course leader at Oxford Brookes and Edinburgh universities. She chaired the teams which attempted to advise ministers on the content of the new English national curriculum and associated assessments. Over to you, Professor Lee. I'm delighted to be here and on behalf of Rachel, my colleague and myself, um, I'd just like to express my thanks for the very, very warm welcome that we've had. Um, India is a delightful com country and we're both delighted to be back here. Um, so the, the question that I'm going to talk about is the purpose of school mathematics and there will be some things that I say that will have a great resonance to the things that Bram said too, but I'm looking at it from a slightly different point. So, the purpose of mathematics. So I've taken this to, um, to have four different elements to it. The first being the future of the planet. And I think this is an incredibly important reason for thinking about what should be in the mathematics curriculum. At the moment in America, um, we have Trump who is deciding to change one of the ideas about uh, coal firing uh, energy and pumping stuff into the air. And in the other part of the world, we've got people talking about the green ideas. And these two things seem to be not represented by the evidence. People don't seem to understand the evidence. And I think what we need is to think about a curriculum which eventually leads to people who can talk with some authority about the evidence and the mathematical evidence that can help us to make the right decisions for the future of the planet. So that's a very sort of laudable aim probably something that we can't really think about when we're in our classrooms, but I think it is something that we ought to keep in mind, that we need to be, be able to produce people who are going to be able to contribute to the future of the planet in that way. The future of commerce and industry. I mean, one of the really interesting things about the UK is that we are in dire need of really good mathematicians. And we know that we need really good mathematicians for the future of our country. Uh, we don't have a lot of stuff that we can sell, but what we do have is the intelligence of the people in our country that we can export. And it's really important, therefore, that we think about the curriculum and, and, the, and the way that the curriculum helps us to have the future workforce. One of the, pe the seminal writers in the UK is a Russian chap called Alexander Borovik. And he says this, that... Actually, if we think about the future of, of our individual countries, we now have a situation where we need people who are much better educated than they used to be in mathematics and in the technical areas so that they can contribute to still making even more progress. And this means it's quite difficult to actually think about how we can have a curriculum that really allows students to be able to have even more advanced knowledge. How, when students leave school, are they going to be really poised to be able to take on those really big challenges and really push forward the technical things that we need? And he says that this is, there's a real tension here because the sorts of um, education that we need those people to have actually takes a long time to acquire. So if it takes a long time to acquire, what should the curriculum in school look like to ensure that they are best placed to acquire that knowledge in the shortest period of time? In the UK, we have another problem. You may have heard of Brexit. Have you heard of Brexit? Well, America has Trump and we have Brexit. 
And I think both of these, but especially Brexit, has arisen because when you looked at the political discussions that were going on, the populace found it very difficult to interpret the mathematical content that was given to us and to know what was true and what was not true. So I think one of the purposes of a mathematics curriculum should be in order to enable us to have a competent and a confident citizenship. People who can contribute to society by making sensible and well-informed decisions. And one of the things that we know about the UK workforce is that actually there are over 60% of the UK adult population who are operating at or below the level of, a, of an 11-year-old. Now, how can you possibly make sensible decisions about society and the needs of society if you're struggling to do even quite basic mathematics? So the whole thing about understanding statistics, understanding probability, understanding large data sets should be something that is in every curriculum because it's one of the ways in which we can actually contribute to the decisions about society. The really interesting thing about that is that um, although only 60% uh, 60 can't do it, a lot more of them have actually passed the school exams. So they have got a good grade in their school exams, but if you ask them to interpret some information which is out in the public place, they can't do that. So I would say, therefore, that in that sense, our curriculum is not fit for purpose. I don't know quite so much about yours, but certainly, talking from a UK perspective, ours is not. So you can see how much it actually costs the country in making the wrong decisions about society and about our own, our own employment prospects. I, I have an absolutely fantastic job. I can go and talk to all sorts of people and I can travel all over the world. Um, some of the most interesting things happen when you actually talk to children. And I did a research project a little while ago where I traveled all the way around the UK talking to children about what they thought mathematics was. And with a few exceptions, I can tell you that their view was actually quite sad. First of all, when I said, what mathematics have you been doing in school? They said things like, um, we've been doing fractions, and now we're going to be doing decimals. Um, we've done bar graphs. Um, we've done Pythagoras' theorem. We did some things about sine and cos, or even more sadly, page 72. And I thought, okay, so if I'd asked them about what had they been doing in music, or what had they been doing in art, they would probably have said, oh, I've been making this, or I designed this. I had something personal that I created. There were only three children in probably about 400 that I interviewed who said anything about their own personal mathematics. None of them saw mathematics as being a creative subject. They didn't realize that there are places like this where mathematics is still being invented and created. They thought it was all done and dusted. And they thought that if they were in grade three, their job was to do the mathematics that last year's grade three did and next year's grade three will do because that's what you do when you study mathematics. Neither did they see that mathematics was connected. They thought every little bit of mathematics was in a separate little part. So that's why they say, we've done fractions, we've done decimals, because they think it's in a little box of its own. They don't see how it's all connected. So I think the curriculum is really missing a trick. I think if we have a curriculum which doesn't help children to see the connectedness of maths and the awe and wonder of maths, doesn't help them to see that it's connected, and also doesn't give them a sense that they actually can have some personal enjoyment and do some personal maths of their own, 
I think we're missing a trick. So I think whatever our purpose for the mathematics curriculum, I think students should have a rich mathematical experience. Whether they find mathematics easy or whether they find mathematics difficult, they should still know a little bit about what real mathematics is like. And you talked about real mathematics experiences. And this is a real coincidence, Ram, because you used a quote from Wheeler. Now, how many people could we have quoted from? But I've chosen a quote from Wheeler as well. And this is, this is his quote. I'm not going to read it to you. I'm just going to let you read it. So I don't know about, about here, but I know in the UK, most children can't wait to stop studying mathematics. When you talk to children about what they're going to do post-16, the thing that they have the greatest relief about is that they don't have to do any more mathematics. I think that's a really sad reflection. So my question, which is not what is the purpose of mathematics, I think my question is, is it possible to design a curriculum which actually meets all these different purposes? Can one curriculum do all of these things? Can we create a curriculum that allows people to contribute to the future of the planet? Can we design a curriculum that allows people to contribute to the future prosperity of their country, especially thinking about the real concentration now on, the, on technology and all of those really mathematical subjects. Can we have a curriculum which allows teachers, uh, t allows teachers to help their students to become better citizens, more informed, confident and competent citizens, so that they can make sensible decisions for themselves, but also that they can contribute to sensible decisions for society, and perhaps from my point of view, and in my heart, I really believe it. Can we have a curriculum that helps students to see the awe and wonder of mathematics so that they understand why people want to work in places like this and we're not just sad people who can't think of anything better to do? Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lin. Uh, that was wonderful and it's quite remarkable the sort of convergence of ideas and thinking and at the same time highlighting other uh, different aspects I think. So we uh, will move to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Shaila Shirali and I hope that we can connect and I don't know if there's any message from uh, Mr. Uday Chandran. It's okay. No, okay. All right, so we uh, go to uh, Dr. Shailesh Shirali, who I have already introduced, and I hope that it will work now. Hello, uh, Shailesh, great, we can see uh, you on video now, it's quite clear. Yeah. Can you okay, hear me? Okay, thank you, yeah. good to hear that. Yeah. I okay. hope you can hear me clearly. Very clearly, yeah. Okay. So please go ahead, you have uh, 12 minutes. And uh, we're very eager to hear what you have to say. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much and good morning to all of you. And uh, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to this conference and uh, giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts with you. I apologize not only for being not present physically, but also missing out on what was said by the previous two speakers. It's, uh, I feel that's most unfortunate. So let me just start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Shailesh Shirali. I'm the director of Sayadri School, which is part of the Krishmurti Foundation India Schools. And I have been with the KFI for many years, for 35 years in fact, and I've been in, uh, involved in math education for even longer than that. And I've also been involved with the Mathematical Olympiad movement in India for a couple of decades. And for quite some time now, I have been writing a lot on school-level mathematics. I edit a journal called At Right Angles, which is addressed to teachers and students. So one of the first questions that was posed in the write-up sent to us was, why is this an area of interest to me? So let me just say this very briefly, that my interest is in education as a whole. Uh, in being with children, and to me education is a much larger issue than math education, 
And mathematics has always been a deep love of mine. So the two sort of link got linked together in a very uh, in an organic way. Now let me list a few issues with mathematics education today as I see them. I'm afraid I don't have something very dramatically new to say in this area because it's all fairly obvious. The issues would be a content heavy formula packed syllabus which encourages students to memorize formulas and worked out examples and basically engage in reverse engineering. I think that has become part of the mentality, particularly in India. Then a social context which, in which speed and examination performance are given excessive importance, totally disproportionate to their true worth. Then you have a context in which very few students feel they have a happy, relaxed relationship with the subject. Then you have another issue, which is the shortage of teachers who really have a love for the subject, and in particular, a love for problem solving and for exposition. And finally, an even greater shortage of teachers who realize the full responsibility of school education. So these, in, I, in brief, are what are, I see as the issues facing us. So let me now describe how I look at mathematics education and uh, what is ex exactly we hope to do in this. I feel that it is vital that the experience of learning mathematics leaves behind in the student's mind a feeling for beauty, a feeling for order, a feeling for richness, a love of inquiry, and a love for, of sharing this with others. It is essential, I feel, that every child experiences joy of discovering something original and feels pleasure in learning the subject. Because that kind of an experience then stays with you for a lifetime. And I see no reason why this short should not be possible, barring extreme circumstances. I view mathematics as a science of patterns. Building on this, a natural consequence is that the child should be introduced at an early age and in a happy, playful way to experimentation in mathematics, in carefully chosen contexts that enable such discovery. For example, just to give a few simple examples, slicing a pizza using straight cuts and working out a formula for the number of pieces you get as a result. Counting the number of ways in which a rabbit can jump up a staircase in jumps of one step or two steps. Uh, then the number of ways in which an integer can be expressed as an ordered sum of odd positive integers. Then exploring which numbers can be expressed as a difference of two squares. Or exploring which numbers can be expressed as a sum of two or more consecutive positive integers. These are well-known problems of elementary number theory and combinatorics, but they never fail to bring out an expression of joy in children. Such explorations, I feel, enable the discovery of sequences that arise naturally. Much joy can be experienced, experienced through these explorations, joy at encountering the unexpected. In general, elementary number theory and elementary graph theory offer numerous contexts for such themes. These contexts allow us to introduce the notion of proof in a natural and non-threatening way. As is fairly well known, proof is one of the the main points where people experience blocks in school education. I have found in my own experience that inductive and recursive thinking come quite naturally to children, much more naturally than one would expect. And I think one should build on that using topics from discrete mathematics. For example, in the study of 3x3 three three and 4x4 four four magic squares, which are small enough in size to allow for experimentation and yet contain enough surprise and richness. I think it's essential that all children should have an exposure to such topics. Yet another well-known example from discrete mathematics would be cryptography, a topic that combines play as well as mystery, and these come so naturally to children. From numbers, one can move to the study of geometry, explorations with geometric forms, 
especially those that build an appreciation of symmetry and a feeling for visual beauty. For example, playing with tessellations, with mosaic, with wallpaper, with carpets, with frieze patterns, strip patterns, braids, then playing with rangoli and kolam, which is so much a part of the tradition of this country, encouraging and urging children to design their own patterns, playing with spirals, exploring ways of making spirals, looking for spirals in nature, nature origami and paper folding in general, and the rich uh, potential potentialities that these offer. Playing with geoboards, discovering relationships on, in polygons that can be drawn on geoboards. Playing with string models and straw models for polyhedra, and so on. This list can actually continue indefinitely. I consider it as essential that children are exposed to dynamic geometry software, for, for example, GeoGebra, which is now very well known at a young age. I think there is something wonderfully empowering about such software. And adventurous students and teachers can even take up the exploration of 3D geometry using GeoGebra. Nurturing a, prob a love of problem solving is, I think, an essential part of mathematics education. And I believe it can be begun at a very early stage using age-appropriate materials. And of course, one should mention that children naturally love puzzles and challenges like Sudoku, coin problems, river crossing problems, especially when they occur in a playful context. And one should build on this love. At a slightly older level, you have the rich Sangaku tradition from Japan which offers such a wonderful context for encountering beautiful and unexpected geometrical results. And the nice thing about the, these things is that one does not need very advanced knowledge to study them. In fact, nothing more than Pythagoras' theorem and elementary circle theorems. So I think I have gone over a number of topics which I feel are essential to expose at a school level, uh, especially at the older level. And especially in today's context, when the examination syllabus tends to crowd out all thinking along these dimensions. I'm going to end by touching on a more difficult, but at the same time a vitally important matter, which may sound a bit controversial. That is that for far too long, we have thought of mathematics education as something separate from other aspects of education. This to me seems wrong and also self-destructive. To me, it seems that love of inquiry cannot be just restricted to a subject. And an essential responsibility of the mathematics teacher is to nurture a love of inquiry in all areas of life. Similarly, the love of order. Why does it need to be within mathematics and science alone? Why cannot it spread out into life as a whole? I consider it essential that the mathematics teacher grapples with larger questions of this kind alongside questions of a purely mathematical nature. A fundamental principle in mathematics and science education is that we do not submit to the authority of a book or an individual. Rather, the logic of the subject is itself the authority. The inquiry itself is the authority. Why can't this principle spread into life as a whole? Why must it stay within the confines of a subject? Why should we accept authority in matters where we, we normally accept it very easily in matters of behavior and religion? I feel that mathematics teachers and science teachers have a crucial role to play in the nurturing of healthy and robust attitudes in such matters. In particular, the love of truth. And I would say that closely related to this and very relevant in today's world, is the question of ethics and right action, taking responsibility for one's actions, for one's talents, having the right attitude to one's own gifts, not using one's mathematical or other talents for wrong ends. School education and mathematics teachers have a fundamental role in nurturing right attitudes in such matters. So I feel that school teachers need to be proactive in such matters and what they communicate to students needs to, to go much beyond the love of mathematics. And I'll conclude this section by saying that 
All this has relevance precisely because of the extraordinary power and reach of mathematics. It is a subject like no other, with the potential to bewitch and charm and destroy all at the same time. And I think this demands a certain modesty and withholding on our part, which is part of school education. So lastly, we've been asked to say something about priorities for the future. I think the biggest priority is teacher education, which at least in this country has been at a very low level. Much stronger efforts need to be put in place for teacher education, whereby we nurture in teachers not only a love for the subject, which is a love for problem solving, a love for, of exploration, a love of the subject content itself, and also alongside a healthy appreciation of the potential for misuse of the subject. And as pointed out just now, also a feeling for the responsibility, overall responsibility that a teacher has, a responsibility for life, a responsibility for truth, a responsibility for right action. I feel that one cannot shy away from such matters any longer. There's an old saying which goes, whatever subject one teaches, what one actually teaches is oneself. And I think this is a hard lesson which we all need to learn. So I think we, it's part of our responsibility to talk and write about such matters widely so as to reach large numbers of people all over the country. So let me conclude here. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share these thoughts with you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shailesh Rali. That was uh, wonderful. We could hear you very clearly. It was uninterrupted and uh, very engaging and enlightening as well. So I think we have uh, finished the presentations by the panel speakers. It's uh, remarkable that uh, they have uh, touched on somewhat similar things and I think uh, also trying to extend our perspective and vision well beyond mathematics into society, how mathematics and mathematics learning meshes with uh, social realities and society as a whole. Uh, <clears throat> uh, perhaps I'll uh, only summarize what the uh, speakers have said at the end of the, this, this session. Now, this is a chance for us to uh, respond in some way for you, the audience in particular, to what you've heard the speakers say. And some of the concerns that you have brought to this hall, perhaps the speakers have not addressed directly, this is the opportunity to, to bring them in. And I'd like to uh, suggest to you a few uh, questions that you might think about. And what we will do is to take about five minutes time and we will discuss these questions with your, the person sitting next to you. So you can you know, air your thoughts. If you want to bring up something which is not in the questions, please do so. Feel free. This is your time and this is your flow uh, and opportunity. So here are a few questions which you might want to uh, think about, uh, which is what is, I think some of this, uh, they have been addressed by the speakers a little bit. Uh, what's the purpose of mathematics for different groups of students? I think the speakers did say something about certain groups of students and in, you know that in our country we have very diverse uh, student population coming from very different backgrounds, having very different futures. Uh, so what does uh, the purpose of mathematics and mathematics learning mean for all of them? And how does this, who determines this purpose? In the sense, do they have a say in putting these purposes or goals forward? Do they get reflected in the curriculum and in the processes of curriculum development. Are the stated purposes of school mathematics really necessary for everyone? I mean, this is something that a critical uh, perspective that you could bring. Uh, the, there are purposes stated in the maths curriculum, the purposes stated by the speakers. Do you think these are purposes for every child, for every student? Or do you think there are some other purposes that you would like to highlight? 
And does the current curriculum meet the stated purposes? Where is the shortfall if it doesn't? What does it actually succeed in meeting? And so on. So I think what we're looking for is some critical engagement. Bring your own concerns, your own thoughts. And please take time now. We have about five minutes. I'll call on you again after five minutes. And you can uh, ask questions, which I'm sure the speakers will be very happy to uh, respond to. Shailesh, are you able to hear me? I'm able to hear. Thank you Wonderful. very much. Wonderful. So when uh, the questions are put, all the three speakers can hear and they'll be able to respond. So your time starts now. Please talk to your, the person sitting next to you. Uh, take about five minutes. Yeah. If there's no one sitting next to you, please move, find somebody. <laughs> So I can see a lot of active talking and engaging. Uh, we have, unfortunately, only limited time. So, uh, you know, it's wonderful. I think let those thoughts continue. Express yourself on the mic. And uh, you can go ahead and ask your questions. Is there a mic which can go around? Or shall I pass this? Uh, and... Uh, as you're about to uh, ask your questions, let me point out to you that the next session is going to be about curriculum design and what should go into the curriculum and so on. Of course, these questions of the purposes of school maths education and what should go into the curriculum are very interlinked. They overlap. And what you have to say will certainly also overlap between these two themes. But because we have that session coming up next, so I would suggest that you focus more on the purposes and let's leave uh, things like what should go into the curriculum, design of the curriculum, for discussion in the next session. Yeah. Please also identify yourself uh, as you ask your questions because it's being recorded. Yeah. Sundaram. My name is Sundaram. I worked as a math educator, mostly in the primary school. My question is slightly different from today's focus. We are all talking to a converted audience. And we are talking in closed circles. There's a huge society waiting to even, they don't even understand the problem. And today technology is available to spread your views. What are we doing to even put these issues in the public platform? Why are we keeping quiet when so many policies, etc., obviously are not Promoting education. I mean, why are we just keeping quiet? That's my question. And that's what I think Dr. Shirali said. We need to, but today technology is available for an individual to talk to the world. What are we doing about it? Thank you. Thank you. Excellent uh, point. We collect a few questions and then we uh, ask the speakers to respond. Uh, good morning. I'm Ponlata. I'm a math teacher. Um, I strongly feel when we talk about the purposes of math, we should include even the learners as part of the forum. When we talk about why do they learn something and how they would like to learn that, I think it's very important to count on their views as well, rather than adults taking the things in our own stride. Uh, that would give us more purpose and that would give us the aligned uh, outcome. Because ideally we want this to be reformed for them, isn't it? So I think why not include them? I think I'm thinking on those lines. Uh, I think I would, this would be the major takeaway for me and I would definitely ask this question to all my teachers. I think that's a really good point, but before you hand over the mic, I mean, since we haven't done so and we could do that in the future, would you like to speak on behalf of them and put something in front of us which you think you know, is important for learners which we are not addressing? Would you like to say something? I think they would like to know why they are learning something, why they, they should learn algebra, why they should have 
um, a data handling topic why should the, they should do a data uh, based inquiry why they cannot just observe and go on why she, why they should tabulate things and why they should look out for patterns in geometry why are we saying these things are important and if we can show them that i think they would be more invested in learning it and exploring it and further creating some stuff on their own i think this is more important but how do we do it i'm still under that question mark and we have to find out more on that yes. thank you very much yes. shri guru bio namaha i am mrs kalpakam I'm sorry for the bad throat uh, i uh, actually very uh, happy to be here today a new learning today basically uh, i agree with mr uh, what mr sailesh said to some extent the love and passion in us is slightly deteriorating in our, in this generation of teachers because we are not able to cultivate the interest in the minds of the children continually it is not double discontinuity there are innumerable discontinuities there that's the biggest problem and challenge for the teachers i feel all always i feel math teachers are in the bounded region with multiple constraints of examinations and finishing portions and competing with the competitive exams and so on in this earlier in our age group only the classroom was the primary learning and the teachers were god but now it's not so classroom learning is no more primary learning for them there are many outsourcing learnings which are happening either earlier or after the first learning whatever it is how do we still inculcate the interest in the minds of the children to meet the purpose the shortfall is how to meet the purpose i feel sir rightly asked what is the shortfall i feel does the current curriculum meet the stated purpose the current curriculum the teachers do their best to meet the purpose but still it is not so uh, as a teacher in this field for around 26 years i just want to know still how to continue the interest in the minds of the children to learn mathematics they are still asking commerce students ask why should i learn vectors even though you give real life applications why should i learn three dimensional geometry which is no way connecting to my commerce or that or this even though to some extent you speak about inflation that this etc for differential equations it's difficult it's difficult to reach them literally in the sense how to make them understand and continue with the interest so the main shortfall i feel is uh, the teacher should go for more orientation programs and they should develop uh, the different ways of learning and teaching effective learning to happen in the classroom thank you for the opportunity given hi my name is narmada i work for uh, a students edition a tamil students edition named dinamalar um we are doing you know a lot of uh, math communication to students and i um uh, from uh, like what we are doing uh, you know um basically i want to actually uh, speak about you know uh, what the purpose of mathematics is for group of students from the experience of you know um uh, Uh, handling content for students uh, we we used to come across questions you know from students uh, children ask uh, questions just to explore how mathematics is actually connected you know in the real life situations you know they ask questions like are numbers uh, uh, you know how numbers are different from patterns or are they one and the same so i think you know students try to actually understand how mathematics designed their uh, you know like immediate uh, life what kind of role does mathematics uh, play in the real life situation uh, so that's what my question is like in the as the previous two people said that the purpose of mathematics is like as you said that uh, like two fold that someone is like enjoying mathematics and some other maybe like what industry and all needs so when the and to me the school education is more focused to what like industry needs and what we need in practical life and that is somehow like orthogonal to what like what we can enjoy in mathematics like you don't need graph theory in some where 
some in much places so like how do you connect these two purposes could you identify yourself please uh, so i am arijit i study computer science hi sir um, my name is vijay baskar i am working as a mechanical engineer i am having interest on in mathematics and i am taking some tuitions like that so my uh, my idea on this uh, question is everything is perfect we are having a perfect syllabus perfect curriculum everything etc uh, even though uh, the, in india there are very various kind of syllabuses are there um, international cbse samachir everything even uh, a least level syllabus is okay here but what is the real problem is um, there is a high high illiteracy in the adults ad adults of india so uh, here uh, dr shailesh uh, told that a uh, better um, uh, training for teacher in in future it is needed like that but my point is a better training for parents it is needed because 90% of our parents are very much not interested in mathematics they are uh, they are uh, they are completely un unaware of uh, of the interest on that uh, mathematics actually a maths teacher in india is having 40 minutes for a class in that class he if you go on the, if you go on that creativity mode the syllabus will lag if you go on syllabus syllabus mode the creativity mode uh, will lag so in that 40 minutes he can do very less less only that, that, that is the problem if you give if you give half day for a, for a max teacher for all for all max teacher in the world half day you can take then he can teach mathematics in very very much good manner that, that is my thing then uh, the lack of time is the biggest problem so this lack of time can be fulfilled by the uh, higher interest of the parents in mathematics so the uh, so that is the thing so 90 uh, for example a vector plus b vector is equal to c vector that is a simplest uh, uh, vector algebra theory yeah everyone know uh, yeah, yeah, everybody can understand that if you if you want to go uh, uh, reach a place through a vector and b vector then if you grow by cross uh, cross path c vector then we can reach that but when i when i submit that article to a leading a leading magazine in tamil that editor can't understand that even though he is a graduate of a literature or anything and non mathematics up to plus 2 he is studying the mathematics but he, is, he he can't he is unaware about that vector algebra or simple logic so that article is get rejected so these kind of things are exist in india so so parent level parent level education should be on separate programs you have to do for example we are studying on shakespeare and in, in in tamil there is a great poet called as kambar bharathiyar the, the these are all in school syllabus it is very less but everybody knows bharathi because there are various programs uh, like, uh, that is taking place on bharathiyar bharathiyar the, the, there is various, various programs but in uh, but on mathematics it is very less only for, uh, regarding ramanujan we are celebrating that also uh, ramanujan is a great mathematician everybody will tell but what ramanujan tell uh, no no parents will tell in facebook also everybody share ramanujan 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 you think but what ramanujan you, you, you tell one one single theory of ramanujan oh sorry i have to study next year i will read and tell. so that is the real problem the unawareness of maths in parents that is the thing we have to uh, sort out here thank you Thanks. i think that's nice you pointing to the fact that one of the purposes should be the connection to the wider culture of maths education that's nice So, Namaste. I'm Shivakam Sundari. I'm a math teacher. Uh, the uh, the purpose of school mathematics is all very well uh, laid out and very very interesting. We would love to uh, meet those purposes in class as it is. In fact, in our school, we started uh, uh, quite two or three of these purposes, and at least at the primary level, where the uh, time bound of uh, examinations, we don't have examinations until class five. so we thought of uh, uh, having all these kind of uh, you know we changed the strategy of teaching mathematics but then we have lot of mails from parents who said that uh, what are you doing i don't even see two sums being worked out in the uh, the one month of classes have happened and you've not even completed two pages of mathematics so as he rightly said the parents also need to understand uh, about uh, if at all we are going to change the 
uh, way of uh, teaching mathematics. As a middle school and high school uh, mathematics teacher, we face a problem of this time-bound uh, testing and uh, assessment and board exams and all that. So if we try to um, meet one of the purposes, the other purpose is lost. And uh, we are really uh, in a fix there. So, and one more uh, problem that I, we face is that uh, we have in a set of, say, even 25 set of students, we have five students who are really quick in grasping and giving uh, the answers. We, ha we target the middle uh, level students, so we go to their pace. And we have another set of uh, five students who are totally disinterested in mathematics. And uh, within the 40 minutes time frame, we are uh, unable to meet all of these. We call for special classes to meet their requirements. So we are really, uh, we would love to do these, but we do not know how. Good morning, all of you. My name is uh, Sudha, and uh, I've been uh, working with children with learning disabilities for the past uh, 25 years. Uh, what uh, I would, my take on the whole thing is that uh, we are having children with attention issues. Uh, we have uh, children with language processing issues. Uh, we are children. Uh, the, we are having children with lot of self-esteem issues, lot of severe blocks in learning. So uh, my take on this talk was: I was very impressed with, uh, with uh, Professor Ramanujan's uh, statement that uh, this mathematization of the thought process is what I would see as the larger purpose of teaching maths. Because if we can organize the child's thought process and uh, bring a certain uh, creativity along with the discipline in the thinking process. I think then we can transcend that same thought process to other areas of, you know, uh, social problems and, you know, other, uh, what uh, you were mentioning about, uh, you know, the person, the planet, the industry, the commerce and society. I think that's where uh, we really need to uh, target more uh, on the process and the thinking and a mathematical kind of thinking where we are talking about cause effect and logic and sequence and you know reasoning and patterns and creativity and then apply it to a larger context okay so I thank suggest you very much that we, thank you very much i suggest that we now take a break from questions and uh, listen to the panelists we don't have too much of time and we do want to uh, the panelists to respond so I'd request uh, uh, Shailesh, I hope you were able to hear those questions. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> were you able to hear the uh, various questions and uh, uh, would you, were you able to hear them, the questions? Yes, uh, I did hear them, okay. Yeah. So if you, if you'd like to, I'm going to ask the panelists to respond. At, at any point, would, if you'd like to respond, just uh, come in with your voice because we can't uh, uh, quite see you. Uh, so, uh, would you like to go first, or shall I ask the other uh, to respond to some of these things? No, I'll come in a bit okay. Yeah. Great. So, uh, Jan. Um, well, there are many things that have been said. I want to respond to one or two things um, about uh, children not. Uh, finding mathematics useful or uh, you know complaining about uh, why we are learning this now i think one big part of the blame lies with the us as educators as book writers for everything i mean a chapter on uh, fractions starts with uh, you know these are called uh, Mixed fractions, these are called improper fractions, these are called proper, what's proper or improper or whatever. I mean, why are you doing this, right? We do, there is a, almost all mathematics texts, almost as a kind of policy, even however well they explain, very rarely engage with why you're doing any of this. So the right to ask, why am I learning this, is not there. I mean, I see this all through in university as well, right? Nobody goes to the Board of Studies and says, why is... Uh, you know, linear algebra being taught here. Why is this, you know, why should I learn this now? So this is not part of our thing at all. And that's cutting across most this thing and mathematics it's especially so. But there is a different one when it comes to smaller children. Do children complain about why am I learning this when they are actually enjoying something? No, they don't. 
So please understand that part of the problem about asking, why should I learn this at all, right? They're not really asking for real life applications. I don't quite believe that. But where they do enjoy it, where they have a sense of success, they don't ask, why should I do that? They just want to go on and do more. So much of the problem is not what they actually say. If you look a little behind, it is a sense of failure. It's a sense of uh, anxiety, fear. So it's more about that. Wherever children engage with uh, confidence, a sense of success, they don't ask, they're willing to trust you to say why you're doing. I mean, they're actually willing to trust adults on that. But much of the time it's because you're boring me, it's horrible, I'm failing and failing and failing repeatedly, and you're making me do this, why don't you tell me why I should go through this? So it's a plea for, you know, a sense of, I would say a sense of success is extremely important. Do we ever do things in which we have a sense of failure? So this is something I would say, one important thing that came up and uh, that I want to respond to. There are other things that I want to say too also, but perhaps uh, maybe I later. So it's all very complicated, isn't it? Everything's connected to everything else. And if one thing doesn't work, other things don't work. Perhaps one of the questions ought to be, what are the purposes of examinations? Because actually they are one of the real driving forces or about what happens in the classroom. Uh, in the UK, schools are measured by how well their students do in examinations. So the further up the examination system you go, the more pressure there is on teachers to get their students to get good grades not only for the students for themselves, but also for the school. And so those, those sort of high target assessments mean that they drive what happens in the classroom. So if that's so, and I don't think that's going to change in the short term, you'd better be jolly sure that those assessments are worth doing. Do those assessments, and in the UK they don't, do those assessments reflect what you really want the curriculum to do? So if you have questions which are very closed questions, which can be answered by students practicing the same sort of question, so that when they go into it, they do it automatically, then of course that's what will happen in the classroom. And that's why children will get very bored and turned off and want to know why they're doing things. But if the sort of questions in an examination are ones which are novel questions, where the students really have to bring together the different parts of mathematics, and they have to make connections between things, they have to really problem solve, because a problem's not a problem if you've seen it before. A problem is only a problem if it's novel to you. So if an assessment has that, then maybe that would leak back into what happens in the classroom, and children will see more point in doing the mathematics that they're doing. Certainly that's true in the UK. The whole target, the target setting culture has impacted hugely on what happens in the classroom. But there's another point about that, which is that you can teach to the test, and that's what many teachers do because it's high profile. But I believe actually if you teach well if rather than teaching to the test, you teach mathematics, actually your children will do well in the test anyway. You don't need to teach to the examination. You can teach mathematics well, and children will do well, and they will achieve anyway. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, would you like to say something, Shailesh? Very clear, very clear. Yeah. Well, as you, as I think uh, Jam said that one of the important purposes of school mathematics is learning the skill of mathematization. Uh, I would express it in the same thing in a slightly different way. It is learning to think with clarity, learning to think with precision, and saying exactly what one means, uh, saying it in very precise language. So it's an art which is perhaps not very easy to learn, it comes slowly. And the, but the important thing is that it is linked also with language. So I wouldn't separate learning the skill, learning this art, with learning how to express oneself very precisely in ordinary language as well. So it's an important, uh, it's an important culturation of the mind, I think, 
which were in, in that sense. So mathematics has this dual character in that it is, it is also used for other things. It is very useful for turning one's livelihood. It has so many applications uh, in terms of its actual topics. But this aspect, I think, needs to be always kept uh, at the back of one's, uh, one's mind when teaching mathematics, how to reason very precisely. And so that, that ability to reason, ability to think very clearly carries over into life as a whole, thinking, thinking about oneself, thinking about anything in fact, about social issues. Um, but, and as you also said, I think a very important responsibility in, at the school level is to see that mathematics really is a joyful experience. And I think the act of measuring children, of constantly putting a certain letter grade on a numerical grade to them, constantly comparing them, I think this is obviously a very great obstacle. Unfortunately, the first thing sort of gets mixed up in this also. Because society values certain kinds of skills so greatly. And I think people who have a high order of mathematical ability tend to be looked at uh, a little bit too respectfully, perhaps by society, perhaps enviously, perhaps respectfully, I don't know. Uh, but it, 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 it is, so this is really a large part of an So it's, it's not an issue which, which can be solved at the school level. It's not an issue which can be solved just by teachers. Because the whole of society is very involved in it. But we have to make a start. And I think we have the start perhaps lies in our not giving too much importance to certain kinds of things which perhaps uh, are given too much importance in society grades and measurement and the way people are regarded by others. So all these things need to be kept in mind when we teach in our relationship with children. And we have to take the utmost care not to make children, to compare children, not to make them feel small if they happen to have fewer gifts, lesser gifts than somebody else. Because the other person also is affected. Right? When you give excessive importance to the people, the gold medalists and so on, I think in some ways you ruin those people as well. So it's a very broad, broad problem which and our responsibility is very large in this area. Okay, I'll yeah. Later, yeah. Thank you, uh, Shailesh, and uh, I think we've had a extremely rich uh, discussion. We are sort of reaching we have overrun, in fact, by a minute. So I'd like to, you know, take your uh, permission to conclude the session uh, with making just a few brief remarks. I mean, I'm not going to uh, summarize all that you said. It would need another session, I think, <laughs> and uh, because it's been really rich. So I'm just going to pull out one or two things from what has been said by each speaker and perhaps something from the audience. The first thing I'd like to point to is uh, something that Professor Lin said, which is that when they spoke to students and about their views of mathematics, she said none or very few spoke about their own personal mathematics. So all they did was, you know, what was done out there. I think this is a very deep point, and uh, it relates to the children not feeling a sense of ownership over the mathematics that they learn. They they're not creating anything that they can call their own. Uh, and this might be something very important for teachers to pay attention to. You know, we have the word mastery learning sort of written down in our curriculum. But what is this mastery? I mean, does it, is it, 
it seems to me more of some kind of conformism that you learn the things which are put in front of you. It's not about having total mastery over something that you've created yourself and having a sense of ownership. And I think there need to be some opportunities for this, uh, perhaps at an individual level. So that's one thing. And I, maybe the way to go ahead is the sorts of things that Professor Ramanujam pointed, which is to look at the processes of mathematics. These were all written into the uh, curriculum framework in 2005, and I hope that we take it to heart and we can do uh, more of them and find the time to do it. Of course, there's a, uh, the problems that you've pointed to, that where do we get the time because of the pressure of syllabus and exams and so on. So maybe uh, the, it's also time to look at those aspects uh, critically. And I'd like to mention here the work of a French math educator. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce the name, so I'm going to pronounce it in a way. So Yves Chevelard, Y-V-E-S, Yves, and Chevelard, C-H-E-V-E-L-L-A-R-D. So he talked about uh, the process of mathematization of society. So he pointed to the fact that our society is increasingly getting mathematized. Another way of saying it is that there's mathematics everywhere. But it's something that we need to look at critically. For example, many of the choices we make are now mathematized. Whether you go for this cell phone or that cell phone, this loan, that one, etc. You're always calculating with numbers. So qualitative considerations are being increasingly replaced by quantitative, mathematical, or numerical ones. There's a lot of mathematics involved in choice. Even, you know, you go for a higher discount, so even in some sense our desires are getting mathematized, if you like. And uh, 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 so, but at the same time, you know, when there is increased mathematization of society, it's also accompanied by a kind of demathematization. These two things go hand in hand, demathematization of individuals. In the sense that you're no longer required to do the calculations that even your parents' generation did. You're now, you have instruments in front of you, you have EMI tables and whatnot, so you don't have to do any calculation really. You just look at the numbers and you uh, respond. So as society gets more and more mathematized, it also, the individual gets demathematized. And so this has a certain bearing on math education itself. You know, the quality, mathematization of society means that even quality of human beings, as Shailesh just now pointed out, is somehow measured in terms of a number that can be given in terms of a mathematization of ability. So mathematics becomes a common component in all kinds of entrance tests, competitive exams, uh, even to get jobs which don't really require mathematics. So this is the sort, sort of phenomenon which is driving this. And in the context of that, how do we give power to individual students? I mean, citizens who are growing up, how do they resist this kind of uh, mathematization and still have individual control over their lives and can participate fully as democratic citizens? I think it's something for us to think about. And uh, uh, I really like the point that uh, Dr. Shirali made that we need to think about mathematics in terms of the wider society. Can mathematics promote a sense of uh, responsibility, a sense of control over one's life, a sense of ethics, a sense of oneness? In fact, uh, the uh, mathematician, uh, mathematics educator, Ubritan Ambrosio spoke about what can w mathematics do in order to bring about peace in the world? Can there be mathematics? Can we use mathematics to understand that human beings are somewhere the same? You know, there's a certain oneness to us all, and can mathematics be a doorway to that? I think those are also extremely important questions. And finally, I'd just like to leave you with the very great tradition of uh, coming from Paulo Freire, which is to the tradition of critical maths education. That's, uh, can mathematics be used to read and write the world. Reading and writing the world with mathematics. This is the uh, phrase used by uh, another uh, great math educator called Eric Gutstein, who works with uh, poor children in Chicago. Uh, so can we use mathematics to understand the sorts of things, uh, problems that we are oppressed by in our own lives? And can that uh, give us a sense of rewriting, of how to rewrite the world? Uh, with mathematics. So 
Let me stop here. I think we've had a wonderful session. And uh, I thank all the speakers and also the audience for bringing in a great many issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Shailesh. Professor, you've been so instrumental. And please, class, for him. <laughs> yes, yours is reaching you there, Dr. Shalish. There's some flowers that we're sending for you, and a few things that uh, Lynn carried back from Cambridge. So it'll be with you soon, and I'm so delighted that we had the pleasure of having you in spite of, despite of the few technical issues that we faced in the morning. Thank you very much, and it's been such a delight.